introduce Oren first here. So Oren is currently doing a joint PhD between electrical engineering and computer science, or computer engineering, and molecular genetics with Brendan Fry, Charlie Boone, and Brenda Andrews. Now that would be a committee. Uh, so I'm sure those are pretty interesting. And he's developing, and he's going to tell us about this, uh, he's in, in developing and implementing image analysis and class, classification algorithms to analyze experiments involving large screens of cells with genome-wide genetic perturbation. I just have my genome sequence. I don't have any image analysis. <laughs> what else we can work on? Experiment. Okay, anyways, Oren, over you. Do you want to memorize? Do you want to memorize? Okay. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, today I'll present about um, techniques for analyzing high-content screening of uh, cell images. So uh, high content screening has allowed um, subcellular morphology to be used in large scale genetic screening in uh, biology screening in general. Um, so in our implementation, our experiments generate uh, on the order of 5 million cells per screen. And that's obviously uh, too many images to be uh, categorized or studied by eye. So we need to develop computational tools to analyze these images. Um, so some simple features like cell shape and uh, cell size are pretty easy to calculate. But in our experiments, we're really looking at more complicated uh, phenotypes. So two examples, which I'll discuss later on in the talk, are differentiating between wild-type uh, compartment morphologies versus mutant compartment morphologies. So you can see those are uh, two complicated things to tell apart from the image. Um, and the other uh, experiment I'll discuss is classifying cell cycle into the separate cell cycle stages. Uh, so we'd like to do this in an automated manner. So the typical pipeline for any type of image analysis involves uh, segmentation first. So in our case, we'd like to find where the cells are in the images um, and then kind of treat them as individual objects. Uh, the next step, which is very important, is feature extraction. So we'd like to take the pixel information and extract certain features, which we could then, which are then more descriptive for any type of uh, further analysis we want to do. And further analysis even includes uh, classification or clustering. Or in classification, we like to thin the cells into different categories, and for clustering, we like to group cells into cells that are similar. Um, so in our experiments, we typically have proteins which mark where the nucleus is and where the cytoplasm is. Um, so using that information, I've developed a mixture model-based approach to find these objects. So it's, it's, it uses a non-symmetric mixture model using T distributions uh, to model the, the different components, um, so we can estimate where the nuclear regions are and where the cytoplasmic regions are. And it also includes a Markov random field component to uh, include neighborhood information in the probabilities. So we can uh, use the uh, neighboring pixels to guess uh, the probability of the parent pixel that we're analyzing. Once we know where the nuclear regions are, we use uh, the seeded watershed algorithm with the nucleus as seed as the seeds um, in order to find the boundaries between clusters of cells, because most cells usually appear in clusters, not individuals. Uh, so using this pipeline, we've if I've been able to uh, properly segment the entire test that I had, 185 images, and also uh, segment images from uh, one, of the, one of the screens with a 96.5% accuracy. So once we have the segmented cells, we need to crop them out into individual cell images for further analysis. Uh, so we do that just by uh, drawing a bounding box. So in my case, I've chosen 64 by 64 as the size for the bounding box. Uh, we eliminate the, the surrounding cells, and then I've flattened those images into cell vectors for training for further analysis. So that's just uh, each 64 by 64 image is flattened into a vector um, for further analysis. Uh, so the next step is uh, feature extraction, which I already mentioned is very important. So um, uh, here's a toy example which kind of shows uh, why it's important and how, how it's used. So if we'd like to uh, classify whether a sample image has a motorcycle in it or, in it or not, if we just look at uh, two pixel values from the image um, across different samples, we see that the pixel information doesn't really provide any discriminative power of uh, whether or not there's a motorcycle in the image or not. However, once we uh, use features to, um, uh, to generate, once we uh, extract features from the image, uh, for example, if we have a shape detector which looks for a uh, round objects such as wheels, and another uh, detector which looks for linear objects such as handles, uh, and we transform the image, then we can have um, in, we can have a space in which the samples are easier to discriminate between, and uh, you can generate a decision boundary between those two classes. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we do this in the next slide. So traditionally, um, 
it will use static uh, computer vision based uh, feature detectors. So these are um, filters such as texture, they're based on texture or shape, um, and they're, uh, tra they transform the original images into uh, matrices of data which typically need to be filtered uh, to find the relevant features. Um, recently, uh, machine learning algorithms have advanced this whole process by using the actual data to learn um, proper feature representations. So in this case, you can take uh, labeled data or un unlabeled data, learn features which are much more descriptive, and then uh, apply these to the original images to get better features for further classification and clustering. Uh, so some examples of where these techniques have been really powerful are in uh, object recognition, recognition tasks. tasks. So I have two examples here. One is from uh, Jeff Hinton's group at U of T, where uh, they've been able to beat out other groups uh, with about 8%, by about 8% uh, error, error rates um, on the ImageNet database, in which they have to classify 1.2 million images into 1,000 classes. And uh, they were able to get 17% 17, uh, 17 error rate for their, within their top five guests. Um, Another example is from Andrew Ng's group at Stanford, where they used a deep network uh, and trained it on completely unsupervised on 10 million random frames from YouTube images. And this ne this network, without any labeled data, was able to detect faces with an 80, with about an 80 percent accuracy. So uh, these results have inspired me to use these techniques for uh, high content screening images. Uh, so one approach I've used very often is um, a denoising autoencoder. In this case, uh, the original image is corrupted by dropping out pixels. Uh, it's then passed through a uh, uh, neural network layer where uh, the hidden units are nonlinear functions of uh, the linear combinations of the input pixels. These are then uh, transformed again by the transpose of the original filters to generate a reconstruction of the original image. And then the weights are updated in order to minimize the reconstruction error between the reconstruction image and the original image. Um, so once we train the network, we can use the actual encodings as the features for further uh, clustering or classification. So next I'll talk about a few examples of how to use these techniques. So one application for my group is a project by Ben Grist, where he's uh, using um, markers for uh, nuclear regions, um, receptor regions, and cytoplasmic regions to classify cell cycle. And then he's interested in studying how, pro how different proteins fluctuate throughout the cell cycle. So in his case, I've, uh, I've added another um, classification layer on top of the feature layer, uh, where the different images need to be classified as belonging to one of the six cell cycle classes, plus an additional class for cells that weren't segmented properly. Um, so the results from uh, this experiment show that um, we achieved pretty good uh, classification accuracy. Uh, so for the best network, it was one that was pre-trained on unlabeled data first, and then classified with the uh, additional classification layer. So the test error for that one was 21.8%, uh, where um, most of the errors are due to uh, G1 early stage uh, cells being classified as G1 post start stage. But if we combine those two into one uh, into one class, then we achieve a 13.3% accuracy, 13.3% uh, test error. Sorry, uh, and this is an example of different cells being uh, bent into the different cell cycle stages. Um, so another visualization we can do is if we take the feature space and visualize it in uh, two dimensions using uh, t distribution stochastic neighborhood embedding, we can see that the cell cycle progression occurs along a manifold, which is a good indication that the feature space is uh, descriptive of cell cycle stage. Uh, so a second example is uh, from a project by Erin Stiles, where she's used uh, 20, she's tagged 23 different subcellular compartments, and she would like to study how different genetic deletions uh, affect the morphology of these compartments. So the overall goal is to generate a network where um, G deletions cause um, aberrant, you know, aberrant compartment phenotypes. So for this project, I uh, once again used a denoising autoencoder. But in this case, it's only trained on cells that are labeled as wild type. And the idea is that we can use uh, the reconstruction error itself as a metric for whether or not a sample belongs to the wild type population or not. Uh, given that the, that the network's only trained on wild type data, uh, a cell that is wild type will, uh, will presumably have a lower reconstruction error. So what I've done next is uh, I've fit a properly distribution to the wild type reconstruction error. So that gives us a way of uh, class of generating a, prop a property for a sample given its reconstruction error. So you can see that the uh, mutant 
uh, labeled cells have higher reconstruction errors as we expected. And then we can uh, find a threshold which minimizes the reconstruction error between uh, the cells labeled as mutant versus the cells labeled as wild type. And then for that case, uh, we get a 3.7 training error and an 8.87% uh, test error between the classes. And this is uh, for the specific screen I'm showing here. These are uh, samples that were identified as wild type, whereas these are outlier samples. So you can see they're significantly different. Um, the next step would be to uh, use uh, the classifications and um, use the population model statistics in order to score the different deletions and classify them as hits or not being hits for uh, mutating the wild type morphology. So uh, the takeaway message is that these machine learning approaches can be flexibly applied to any high context experiment. Um, the segmentation can be applied to any, any experiment that includes markers for uh, nuclear and cytoplasm reagents. And the uh, neural network uh, techniques um, are power powerful for any image classification task, and they can be used with labeled or unlabeled data. So finally, I'd like to thank uh, members of the Boone and Andrews Lab, specifically uh, Ben and Aaron, who I'm working with, and members of Fred and Trey's Lab, specifically Jimmy, who's helped me implement the neural network uh, configurations. Questions? Uh, you have cell cycle examples, if you have a large variance in class error, or does it be like a double trigger? Um, you mean uh, for the error metrics? Yeah, the, the error is much, the test error is much larger than the training error. Yeah, so there's definitely uh, some overfitting going on because uh, we don't have, like, for the, to generate the labeled samples, uh, a student has to sit there and, like, look at all the cells. So typically, like uh, the samples, the test sets are around, um, the training sets are around a thousand, between a thousand and two thousand cells, and then we divided those into testing and training samples. So you can see that for uh, some of the networks, there's a higher, there's a lower training error, but a higher test error. So that's indicative of overfitting. So if you increase the drop bar rate, would that help with this uh, overfitting? Uh, yeah, you can see that um, in this example. With uh, we had a dropout on the uh, after the hidden layer, so it helped with the overfitting. Yeah, but, and this one's without dropout. So you can see that with dropout we achieve a lower test error, so it helps with the overfitting. And you can see that the training error is lower without dropout, which is expected. Any other questions? So how dependent is that test error though on the microscopy and the image that you're working? With? Yeah. So um, each data set is, is its own. So like we typically only train on samples from the same experiment. Um, so that is a factor, though. So let's say you do the same experiment like months apart, and then you only train uh, samples from the experiment you did in the initial month. Then some slight variations might cause the network to prefer the samples to train on. So we just generally, when we've generated the samples, we've done it randomly across all the images that are collected. So I kind of wrote a script that um, randomly picks out whatever. Uh, image, yeah, like images from the sample we're training on. Um, so yeah, they, they should be distributed across like all the possible. And the more samples, the better. The more samples. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks.